Hello, my darling true crime angels. Welcome to Web Sleuths YouTube Live. My name is Trisha Griffith. I am so excited because I'm the manager of the best true crime discussion forum in the universe. That's websleuths.com. All of the cases that we're going to talk about tonight, you can all go to websleuths.com, read the discussion. In fact, we have, it's about a three to one ratio, about three visitors to one member because people from all over the world read there. The mainstream media goes there to get information. Law enforcement goes there. Our members are amazing and you can be a part of it too. Just go to websleuths.com. We register during the hours of uh, 10 a.m. and 11 p.m. Central Time. During that time frame, you can look up in the upper right-hand corner. You'll see a register button. You click on that, follow directions, and you are in Black Flynn, baby. So I hope you'll join us on websleuths.com. Insightful one, how are you tonight, my darling? I'm good. <laughs> good. And how are your frogs? Busy. Oh, I'm very, very, very busy. Okay, so here's the deal. Last night, we were so fortunate to have Lauren uh, Mathias on from uh, Hidden True Crime. Sorry, I'm just trying to fix my necklace. I love this necklace. And uh, she was fantastic. And she's going to come on once a week at least. I'm hoping more. I'm going to try and talk her into maybe a night, another night during the week. But we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, so she's... Um, uh, going to take a long weekend because there's no court tomorrow and she'll be back on Monday. But I do have a bit of a report that she gave this afternoon during the lunch break in Idaho at the Chad Daybell trial. And she does this great imitation of Chad Daybell showing emotion. It is hilarious. So we're going to play that. Uh, look, it was a weird day in court today at the Chad Daybell trial. Uh, we're going to go to Nate Eaton at East Idaho News. He uh, has done a great report on it. We're going to pick a little bit from that. But I can tell you today, if you watched any of the trial of the state of Idaho versus Chad Daybell, he's on trial for the murders of J.J. Vallow, Tylee Ryan, and Tammy Daybell, his wife. Lauren... Uh, Lauren said the other night that um, he felt that they were going to, Chad's defense was going to be, it's Alex that did it, that's Lori's brother, and Lori. Mm -hmm. and yeah, he threw those guys under the bus immediately, but there, she felt they also were going to say, yeah, and the Idaho police, they were kind of framing him too. But she was right. That's what they're going for. Yeah. Uh, because today, I don't know if you saw this uh, insightful one, but uh, today, uh, Detective Hermosilla, he was he was on the stand for quite a while, and John Pryor just like kept attacking him like just a rabid animal, just rawr, rawr, rawr. and and the prosecution would uh, have an objection. You know, they'd say objection, and he'd ignore it and just keep right on going. And finally, the judge had to say, uh, "Listen, Bub, don't keep going when there's an objection." He didn't quite quite put it like that. Yeah. I'm interpreting him. I'm his. Uh, I, I'm his uh, mad person. I will. I will tell you what Stephen Boyce is thinking. He can't say it, but I can. Yeah. So, it, it, you could tell he was getting really, really irritated with him. And one of the things that he goes on and on about, and we're going to play this bit of audio uh, from the trial today. He's going on and on about when they went to do a wellness check for JJ Vallow because remember, Kay Woodcock called and said, "Hey, I can't find my grandson." Right. So they went to the, the, I guess it's the duplex where Alex lived in one and Lori lived in one. Lori wasn't there, but Chad and Alex were there. And they didn't record the interview. And come to find out, according to Nate Eaton, the only patrol officers have body cameras. And there's mm -hmm. only like one other camera. And that's down at the police station where they usually do the interviews. And so John Pryor said, well, you didn't take your phone out and record an interview. Why didn't you take your phone out? Blah, blah, blah. Trying to make it look like they yeah. were hiding something, you know? Oh, insightful one. This is going to make me so mad. I'm going to have to save all kinds of money for double, triple blood pressure medication. Oh. Because you and I and everybody out here knows damn well the police didn't do that. Now, look. I'm not one to say the police are perfect. And yeah, there can be some real crappy police out there. I'm, we could go on and on about that. 
However, the majority of the cops are, they want to do their job right. Detectives, they just want to do the right thing. Yeah. And one thing they are, I will guarantee you, is overworked. So the last thing they want to do is take the time to try and frame somebody. You know, they didn't have to try and frame Chad. Yeah. Chad Daybell framed himself because he did it. You know, that's what I was going to say. They were they were called out to investigate, which led them to this big convoluted mess of death mm -hmm. and everything else. They went where the evidence took them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Was, yeah. There was nothing to make up or frame somebody over. You know? Well, you know, if you can't attack the evidence, you attack the messenger. Yeah. And so that's what they're going to do. Yeah. And uh, it was crazy today. It was just crazy. We'll, we'll talk more about that here in a little bit. Also, we're going to talk about the um, the the masked man who jumped out at Tammy Daybell, pointed a, a gun at her. It was an AR-15. And uh, when she called 911, she said it was a paintball gun. Where was Chad during all of this? Why didn't he call 911? Why didn't he rush out there like Dudley Do-Right? I'll save you now to save his lovely wife. Well, I think we all know the answer to that. He had uh, already lined it up with Alex. Alex was supposed to kill Tammy and he didn't. Come on, Scrappy, come on up. He didn't, He because he's, he's a screw up. Alex can't do anything right, you know, he just can't. The only thing he did right was somehow dying when they needed him dead. But anyway, they uh, look, we're gonna talk about the, the phone call to 911 that Tammy made. Her son-in-law made a call too. Come on, come on, Scrappy. Sorry, we're having we're having seating issues. Come here. Let's let Scrappy Joe come up here. Okay, there we go. Okay, come on, come on up. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh my gosh, come on up, 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 right here, right here. Look, right here. Come on, up, up, up. Look right here. I got it right here. Come on, up, 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 up. You can do it. Oh my God. Okay, I'm done. Here, <laughs> kids. Anyway. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Also, OJ's dead. There you go. That's all I need to report on that. Yay. Uh, do you remember the Slender Man case? Yep. Uh, two young teenagers. Uh, it, it looked like they were below average intelligence. Um, had They were playing pretend. And that's, you know, kids pretend. And they were pretending about this character named Slender Man and, and to... I guess a pea slender man, they had to do a killing. Well, they did it in real life. They weren't just pretending. Well, one of the girls uh, wanted to get out of her mental health facility. And she claimed that she pretended to be mentally ill and she wasn't mentally ill at all. And that was her whole defense was she was mentally ill. She didn't know what she was doing, blah, blah, blah. Now she says, no, 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 that's not true. I want to get out. Get Let me out. Give me a conditional release. And we'll talk about what happened there. You can imagine how well that went over. Uh, Brian Kohlberger, the man charged with the four uh, students in Idaho that were murdered. Very contentious hearing today because the defense hired a company to do a survey. And uh, this survey that they did basically tainted the jury pool. Did they do that on purpose so they'd have to move? So they have to change the venue? I don't know. We're going to we have a report from um, Law and Crime on that. And let's see, Gypsy Rose Blanchard files a restraining order against that wonderful man that she just, you know, cooed about and gushed over. We'll read about that. And Kevin Frankie, Ruby Frankie's husband, has filed a lawsuit against Jody Hildebrand. I want to remind everybody one thing. Okay, this was the the eight passengers lady, you remember, and the, her son, uh, uh, her son, I can't, I'm sorry, I forgot his name. Ruby Frankie's son escaped from Jody Hildebrand's house. He was being held and tortured and chained and taped, and he escaped, and the neighbor called 911. Anyway, uh, Jody and Ruby have pled guilty to many charges. Hopefully, they'll be in prison at least 60 years. Well, Jody Hildebrand was a counselor with the LDS Church at the time, and uh, she basically went around and ruined families. Her whole method was... She'd go in, she'd say it was the husband's fault, kick the husband out, then come in and kind of take over the family with the wife. Mm. I feel like, in my opinion, there was something um, more in Jody's mind to get to the wives, if you know what I'm saying. 
But before Jody Hildebrand, uh, uh, Ruby Frankie was famous on YouTube with her eight passengers channel. She had millions of uh, subscribers and she was abusive to her children. It was so bad. And I've repeated this and repeated this, but I need people to remember it was so bad. There was a group on Reddit that kept track of the abusive videos that, uh, that Ruby Frankie was putting up and they would report it to CPS, to the police. Her older kids reported her. It was horrible. She would starve her children if they didn't behave properly. It was terrible. Her husband was there for that, damn it. He was there, okay? So I I'm sorry, but for him to act like I didn't know what was going on, this was before Jody, or before, um, Jody Hildebrand got all, in all involved in it. I, I mean, I am I up in the night inside for one? Am I losing my mind here? Well, you know, it depends on how you look at it. For example, if, I'm not sure exact reason he's suing her. Um, I didn't read. Well, the it whole doesn't thing. really. It's weird. It oh. just says for future losses, and we'll get into that. But go ahead. Yeah. So if if he's thinking, you know, even though he may have known all the weirdness going on, if it was Hildebrand's influence that came in and made Ruby start acting a certain way and hurting the children and leave him, you know, um, mm -hmm. which I could see maybe suing over that. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Right. No, I, I could see a basis there, you know. Right. Well, and let's let's put it this way. I don't have a problem uh, with anybody suing uh, Jody because she's a piece of crap. Oh, my gosh. Wait a minute. Hold on. Back yeah, up, I, Jack. I just read the comment. Finally. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Hey, Trish, Dennis Woodruff. I remember you, Dennis, from high school. Love your stuff. Last night with you and Lauren was great. Well, thank you, Dennis. It is good to see you, my dear. Gosh, yeah. what, a, what a shock. I've got, there's people that are alive. Um, <laughs> they're as old as I am. That's amazing. We Here's see another well, comment he just made. The crazing or, crazies are coming out in force here in, Salt, in Utah. Well, they, they are <laughs> always there. We know that, Dennis, right? <laughs> Being all hail to Brighton. That was our high school, Brighton High School. It was round. It was like two big round donuts. And it uh, started out within the circled halls. Well, they've torn down the school now and rebuilt it. So there's no more circled halls. But good to see you, my dear. And thank you very much. I hope you will keep on this channel. Like I said, Lauren will be here once a week during the trial. So um, it's uh, it's always great when she's here. It, it just, we have so much fun and we learn so much. And we'll be going to her recorded video today for a little bit. So it's good to see you, Dennis. Glad glad you're glad you're old enough and to still be alive and watching. I'm happy for that. Okay. Trish, you're terrible. Guys, I'm <laughs> old. What can I tell you? I gotta remind you all I just keep reminding you I'm old, I'm so, old, I'm old. So in 15 years, because you're 15 years older than me, when I'm mm -hmm. your age, and then I'll be saying how old I am and you'll go, no, you're so young. I will, because I'll be, you know how old I'll be? I'll be yep. flipping I just 80. didn't want to say it. <laughs> I'll be A D. Yeah. A zero. I can't, there's no way that can't happen. There's something weird in this time warp that's going on because I am not that old. I right. remember my 80th grandpa's 80th birthday. He was ancient. He could barely <laughs> talk, he could barely walk, he just drooled, you know, Aww. and it's like, no. No, no. He just, you know, he could hardly do anything. Wow. And he was 80 and we had a big celebration because you made it to 80. That was a big deal, you yeah. know? Well, he you know, really the older people now, I can remember my grandparents always looked like grandparents, right? Right. They were older, but the generation now is different. Like my mom's 81. She looks 60. I believe you that. Know. And so it just, people don't look as old now as they used to when we had grandparents. You know? I think you're right. I think you're yeah. right. Because the old people now are hip because we refuse to be old. That's it. <laughs> yep. Exactly right. Exactly right. Okay. I don't even know where to start here. Oh so God. how about if we start? With, I don't know. Let's just, uh, let's just Bye. jump in. Look at Lynn's comment. You're terrible. <laughs> oh my gosh. Lindy. Hey, I'm talking about 80 <laughs> years old back in the 60s. That's what I meant. Totally different. My girlfriend is 80. She's like 30. Okay. Yeah. I'm talking my, I'm saying my grandfather when he was 80, <laughs> he, I'm not talking about people now, please forgive me. I did not mean that. Yeah. Your friend that's uh, 80 or whatever you just said, I'm pretty sure yeah. she could kick your butt. Oh, I know she could kick my butt. <laughs> There's absolutely no question. She's smarter, stronger. She's, I mean, 
her memory's better, everything about her, you know. But back in the 60s, when you were 80, it was ancient, you oh, know. Yeah. And I just remember being a little kid and trying to get my grandfather to eat. You know, it was it was it was sad. It was just sad. I shouldn't have said the drooling part. That was rude, but I, <laughs> I do remember that. But um you know, he, he, it's okay. And so Wendy, I am so sorry. I did not. I know you don't drool. I'm talking about the 60s, back in the 60s with the 80-year-olds. Totally different than the 80-year-olds now. Everyone's going to be mad at me. I better walk it back. Exactly, Angela Conley. I better walk it back. Okay. So anyway. Okay. Let's go to, how about this? Let me find my pen here somewhere. There's my makeup brush. That won't work. I guess my lipstick will do in a pinch. Here we go. Here we go. Ah, God, do you think everybody will forgive me? I'm not talking about 80-year-olds now. I'm not, I swear. Of course. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm talking about my <laughs> grandfather who was 80 and, and 60, whatever. Okay. So, okay. First, let's, okay. Chad Daybell's on trial. It was day two. And they had to, uh, from what I understand, they had to uh, kind of end the day early because there was supposed to be a witness, but they thought opening statements and jury selection would take a lot longer than it really did. So the, the witness wasn't there yet. He hadn't planned to be there on Thursday. So they have no court on Friday. So we don't know who the witness is, but they'll be there on Monday. So now it is, this is Detective uh, Hermosillo and he is an amazing guy. He was at Chad Daybell's preliminary hearing. And he talks about how they went out to the property and how they found JJ and Tylee. And it's very, it's sad. It's horrible. And talks about the autopsy. And, and all of this was brought up today. And very gruesome. Very uh, emotional. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we went through this with Lori Daybell. And remember when they were going to talk about the autopsy and when they were going to talk about uh, finding JJ and Tylee, Lori wanted to be excused from the courtroom and they wouldn't let her. Good. Well, Chad, he didn't care. There's another day in courtroom to him. Give, you know, hey, he's probably just sitting there thinking, well, when am I going to get my bologna sandwich? Oh, look, there's JJ's autopsy. Where's my sandwich? I mean, really, the guy is... He's a monster. He's a slug too. Remember, that yeah. is what uh, Lauren said that they, the jail people call him the slug. And, and Hey Woodcock called them that on Twitter today. She did. Oh, great. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Let's make it stick. He is. He's just a big yeah. slug, just a blob that's, that wherever he goes is slime. He's disgusting. So, see, even though I'm really old, I'm very immature when it comes to talking about people I don't like. And that's what you have to do to keep your, to keep young, act immature, call people names. It makes you feel better. Okay. So let's see here. Where is it? Because you're mentally not... young, like you're saying. I am very like mentally you. young. I'm very mentally immature. <laughs> okay. We're going to play a little bit. This is from our good friend, Lauren from Hidden True Crime. Uh, she came out to do a break and she did a live stream for about 15 minutes. We're just going to play a few minutes of it. And she does an imitation of Chad Daybell showing emotion. So let's get to this here because it's pretty darn interesting. Yeah. Hang on. Here we go. Chad Daybell showed emotion. Well, I don't know. Micro emotion. Uh, that's how one person put it. Like this is what chad daybell did during this time he was slouching he would shake his head his uh you know he has this kind of like straight like mouth there's my best impression it got a little bit deeper a little bit more like like that you know and then he was going like he was shaking his head like uh take that for what it is uh i'm not the psychologist but i'll ask john when i show him my uh expression Chad definitely looked at me several times and I looked at him. Yeah, I was in an easy place to be seen. But I, I do realize that Chad probably does know who I am. And he has been told by John Pryor because I think it's important to point out that uh, 
I and John, John and I are the ones that interviewed his sister-in-law, Heather Daybell, a three-part interview. That's a very important interview. Heather Daybell has been subpoenaed by John Pryor. Uh, Chad Daybell uh, refers to Heather Daybell as his dark sister-in-law uh, that is has caused a lot of this. And interestingly enough, uh, just by coincidence, Heather Daybell's daughter is married to uh, Detective Hope's son. And Hope keeps coming up. And I am going to suspect that John Pryor might try to cause a connection between those two things. Thank you, Amanda, for becoming a member. But I don't know. I don't know. Um, but so so Chad does definitely uh, look over. We make eye contact. Um, nothing beyond that. But I do think that Chad likely knows me probably as the podcaster people that interviewed his sister-in-law. That is dark. So it would, it would make sense if he's been told that. So after this, so we have a recess after that really, really. Okay. Um, I don't know if you remember that interview, that three-part interview with Heather Daybell, but that wow, was it was, it was fantastic. Yeah. And she stood up to Chad. Hold on. Can you take over Chad? I just need to let Lilith in. I'll be right back. Yes. I remember earlier in one of our texts, I posted the picture of Chad from court today and I said, a total doofus. Oh, yes. Dee Dee Rosner and chat just, what she, she just said, oh my God, he looks like a doofus. And that's so funny. <laughs> he did look like a doofus. Come on, Ross. Exact same thing. Hello, little biddle. Oh. oh, that just rolls off your tongue. Okay, Lilith won't come in. She's clawing at the screen, but she won't come in. He, yeah, that was a perfect description. Doofus. He just, I was watching him there, and so I zoomed in with yeah. my phone and screenshot it. <laughs> exactly. It was, it's, it was great. In fact, if you can email it to me, I'll put it up. Okay. Yeah. Um, irritated woman says, taking notes. Be shady. Stay young. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. 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 Uh, but yeah. Oh, hi. Hi, little Biddle. Oh, thank you. She says, Hit from here from Hidden True Crime. Thank you so much. We are happy to have you, my dear. Thank you. And I hope you become a subscriber. It's free. Just click that subscribe button, okay? Uh, anyway, it, Heather Daybell stood up to Chad Daybell. And of course, he didn't like her because he wasn't used to women standing up to him. Remember, Dr. John said uh, he mentioned his mother like, two or three times in his book, one of his books where he talked about his family, but he constantly talked about his father. Right. But, you know, his, his mother was just nothing, could barely mention her. That's how he treated women. So, okay. Uh, so let's continue on. Today we did see what John Pryor is all about. And he is going to be obnoxious. He is going to be like a bulldozer and he is, going to just ramrod what he wants to get across as much as possible. And he doesn't care if he irritates the judge or not. Now, our other good friend, although we've never met, and he doesn't have any idea who I am, but I just call him my good friend. Uh, Nate Eaton, he's great at East Idaho News. Uh, he did, a, uh, an, and I'll put the links to, to both of these videos up so you can watch the whole thing. Uh, he is He goes in and talks about what Pryor is doing here. And remember I told you he got, uh, he really got on the detective about not recording his, uh, his interview. Well, this is part, this, this is that part. So let's see, hang on here. It's Brian Kohlberger. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Okay. So this is from Nate Eaton, East Idaho news. And uh, this is the part where John Pryor, crawls all over the detective about not recording the interview when he went to do a wellness check on J.J. Vallow, and instead he got Alex Cox and Chad Daybell. Here we go. Oh, I need to share it. That would be good, huh? Hang on. Here we go. If my math is correct, please correct me. 
Did all four of you detectives and, and lieutenants go out at the same time? No, sir. You went out at different times. Myself and Dave both went out initially. Okay, and then when did the other two uh, officers show up? When I called them based on the lies that I had been told. Okay, and these lies that you've been told, um, at that point, you and Detective Hope, neither of you decided to bring a video camera, in, right? That's correct. And neither of you decided to wear a recorder to record any of the uh, incidents that took place about these so-called lies, right? That's correct. And nobody took out their phone and recorded it or made a video or audio recording of the discussion with Mr. Daybell or Mr. Cox on November 26, 2019, right? Let's hear it. And even after you said these so-called lies, even after you discovered that, uh, you know, Mr. Daybell apparently told you something that you didn't think was true, at that point, did you instruct any of the uh, officers who were coming to aid you? Maybe it's a good idea we should bring an audio with, uh, or a video camera with us, or a, a mic to record some of these statements, because I have some concerns. Did you think about that? We, we did that, sir. Hold on. Okay. I'm going that there was an objection and sustaining the objection. So uh, strike the answer. You can ask another question, Mr. Pryor. And it was uh, Detective Stubbs who had the video cam, is that right? That's correct. Sir. And that was when you video cam Ms. Vallow. Um, you were in contact eventually with Ms. Vallow. Is that what the video uh, camera that you're talking about? I didn't have contact with, with Ms. Vallow. Now, um, I'm, I'm a little confused about something, uh, and maybe you can clear this up. You said that um, you asked Mr. Dayball first about whether he had Lori Vallow's phone number, correct? No, sir. I didn't contact Mr. Daywell until after I contacted Alex Cox. Okay. At some point, did you ask for Lori Vallow's phone number for Mr. Daywell? Yes, I did. Okay. And at no point did you ever make a threat to him saying you're going to turn this phone number over to us, right? No, sir. At no point did any other officer walk up to him and say, if you don't turn this phone number over, you're uh, going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. That never took place to your knowledge, right? That's correct. Okay. But then after that, you're saying, at first he said, I'm not going to give you the phone number. And then out of the blue, he decides to give you the phone number. Object. Objection in the states, the facts and evidence. Okay. Then subsequent to that, he Hold on, Mr. Pryor. When there's an objection, I'm going to rule on it before you launch into another question. So the objection is sustained. Okay. Okay. So there you go. Again, that's. Uh, Thank you, Nate Eaton, for pulling that. Uh, yeah, so, you know, he's just real, just coming in, just like a freight train out of control. And I think this is what he's going to do. And, and what he's going to argue is sloppy police work. And they, you know, were going to try to hide their mistakes. So they, they were framing Chad. That's what he's going to argue. And that Chad had no idea that Alex did this. Right. That's what they're going to say. So it's disgusting. Now, in, I got to tell you, Nate Eaton in this inner in this uh, video he did, this woman said, wrote a comment and said, "Are you responsible for the video and the audio? If you are, is it because it's a Mormon church and they're not giving you the right audio and video equipment?" But that just oh. started bragging on him, and he's like, "No, no, I have nothing to do with it." And Nate Eaton said that the court house mm -hmm. has been offered many times great camera equipment from East Idaho news from other professional news agencies. Let us set it up for free and it'll be beautiful. It'll be great. The audio will be wonderful. And they wouldn't do it. Right. They wouldn't do it. It's like, are you serious? So we have to listen to this tin can type thing, but it's better than having the audio released at the end of the day. I don't know what that was about. Mallory, uh, Daybell trial. But uh, let's continue on now real quick and then we'll finish up with Chad and his uh, court case today. They talk about the the man that jumped out as Tammy is pulling into her driveway and uh, she jumps out. She had made some dinners and had 
taken them out to other people and she brought dinner home for her family that she was going to heat up, working her, her behind off while Chad sat home. She gets out of her van and this guy jumps out at her, dressed in black, with an AR-15, and it doesn't go off. She screams, Chad, and he takes off. Her son-in-law calls 911, and then she calls 911. And I thought Lauren from Hidden True Crime had a great theory mm -hmm. that she was going to call 911 and say, you know, this guy had a gun pointed at me, this rifle, and he was going to shoot me. Yeah. But Chad has probably at this point convinced her, oh, honey, it was a paint gun. Did it look like this and this and this? That's a paint right. gun. He was probably just a kid, you know. So we're going to play that 911 call here. Uh, from yeah, Lauren, I watched Lauren earlier and she said he just totally gaslit her. Probably, yeah, absolutely. You know, when, you know. Yeah. yeah, don't worry. Yeah, that's that wouldn't surprise me at all. And, you know, he's probably seething inside because Alex screwed it up as usual. You know, he screwed up shooting uh, uh, Brandon Boudreaux. Now he's screwed up shooting Tammy. So hold on. We're going to get to that phone call here. I think I have it right. 31. Let's try it right here. Okay. Hang on. This is Tammy. Let me share this. And again, thanks to Nate Eaton. We'll put this link in the description. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Where is it? What the hell? Uh, 3113. Just a minute. Okay, let's see here. Here we go. 2019. 21 hours, 49 minutes, 20 seconds. Fremont County Sheriff's Office. Hi, I need to report something. Okay, go ahead. What's the address? Okay, um, at 202 North, 1900 East. The corner with the blinking yellow light on Santa Highway. Is it a suspicious person? Yes. Okay, what was he wearing? He was all dressed in black and he had a city mask on. And he said the blinking light now is where you saw him? No, no, I'm, when I, he's gone now, because um, I pulled up into our driveway and he, I'm getting stuff out of the backseat of my car and suddenly he was there and he had a paintball gun and he was okay. afraid and like, he was going to shoot at me. And I kept asking him what he was doing because I could tell it was a paintball thing. And then he just kept doing it, so I yelled to my husband, and then he took off running around the back of my house. Okay, give me just one minute. Stay on the line with me. Okay. October 9, 2019. 21 hours, 50 minutes, 28 seconds. That was North 1900 East. Okay, 
Freedom. So that freedom is why I love was it. the uh, top. Uh, that was the nine one one call. And again, thanks to Nate Eaton. We'll put the link up uh, to his video that he did today. Uh, I hate morning says ever since that interview, I thought Tylee reminded uh, him of Heather. That could be. Yeah. That could be because you know Heather stood up to Chad. Tylee stood up to Chad. Yeah, two that didn't fall for his baloney. Exactly. Yeah. And to women, oh no, that can't be. Real quick about uh, why they thought it was Alex that was dressed in black. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the cops had tracked Alex to a sporting goods store that day where he bought ammunition for the AR-15, if I'm not mistaken. They also tracked him all over uh, Chad Daybell's property that day. Okay, it's a huge piece of property by the way. And as Nate Eaton pointed out, if Tammy screamed, nobody would have heard her because it's not like a neighborhood where there's houses close by. No, 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 not at all. So you have Alex going all over, like, you know, looking at Chad Daybell's property, trying to figure it out, scoping it out, figuring what he's going to do. Um, how did he know Tammy was going to be the one to jump out of that van? Well, he knew because Chad told him. Okay, if this was just some random guy, he could have jumped out at any time and it could have been Chad coming out of the car. No, this wasn't a random kid with a paintball gun. It was Alex. It was Alex Cox, Lori's brother, trying to kill Tammy Daybell because she was dark, according to Chad, and needed to go. You heard about the Halloween or the mask they found yesterday, right? Yeah, talk, talk about that. Yes, one of the exhibits they showed yesterday was a Halloween mask they'd found in a bag along with duct tape in the garage. Now, I'm trying to look up exactly which house because I don't remember whose house. Mm -hmm. But it was when they were searching for the kids. So I'm they found that what right kind of now. Halloween? Do you know what kind of Halloween mask it was? No. So but they I did mean, discuss it yesterday. Yeah. It was a Halloween. Yeah, I remember them discussing it. it was a Halloween mask and some duct tape. It's like, what happened? Is that how they got Tylee? You know, did they disguise? I mean, oh, just makes me sick. Yeah, I think but, the mask was just so he wouldn't be recognized. Like he was wearing the mask to go shoot her. Probably. I think that's what it was about. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Pussycat says, Chad was jealous of his brothers. Chad did nothing with his wife. With his wife, Yeah, oh, he was very jealous of his brothers. His brothers were very accomplished, unlike him. So it makes me so angry, you guys. It really does. And you're right, Glamis girl. Tammy had a great insurance policy. And didn't Chad even want to try and increase it at some point? Yes. He, right. right. It was not too long before she died. Yeah. Right. But he got like $400,000. So, I'm, you know, that was enough to keep his little cheerleader happy. So, exactly, Dee Dee Rosner, acting like the three stooges, the three of them, but they were able to murder at least three people that we're aware of, probably more would be my guess. So, anyway. That phone call from Tammy, that 911 call, just listening to it, that's really chilling. It is. I mean, especially we know what happens later. Well, a few weeks, a couple dying. weeks later, yeah. like 10 days later, she dies. And, and you have to wonder. Yeah. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. And then in her call, she's saying it's a paintball gun. So, yeah, that seems to be, from what we've learned, Chad's influence. Exactly. You know? Yeah, the paintball gun part. It. Yeah. Think about when she probably realized at some point that Chad was killing her that night. God. And I'm sure she thought back to the paintball gun and realized it wasn't a paintball gun. She realized he's trying to kill me. I, I can't, I can't even go there. I can't imagine what her family does. I can't mm -hmm. even imagine. There was that Facebook or post she'd made after that happened too. Yes, she and made a I Facebook believe, post. Yeah, I believe in the post, she says her husband told her it was probably a paintball gun. Yes. I'll have to find it. But I think that's what, where that came from is definitely from Chad. And just like Lauren was saying on her thing today, yeah. Yeah. And, and they brought up that Facebook post, but they didn't call it a Facebook post. It, that was a big kerfluffle. They kept calling it an email and then a text, but it was a Facebook post. And Tammy posted it to warn people. Hey, everybody, you know, like and I'm paraphrasing, be on the lookout. Here's a weird thing that happened to me. You know, this kid, I think she called him a kid, jumped out and 
had a paintball gun. And yeah, I do think she mentioned Chad said it was a paintball gun. Really? So, I didn't get to listen today. I was busy all day, so I missed whatever happened today. I have to re go back and watch it. Yeah. Uh, both, I'm glad they mentioned that post. Yeah. Both Nate and, uh, and Lauren had great recaps, so definitely. But uh, yeah, if you could find that post, it's got to be mm -hmm. somewhere. Uh, oh, yeah. Handy. But anyway, so, and there was, you know, a, just your usual, not your usual, but uh, just a lot of back and forth with John Pryor. He has now shown us what they plan to do. And that is just jump in there and confuse the issue. John Pryor was bringing up uh, Melanie Gibb and her fiance. Well, like Nate said, these people don't know who Melanie is. Why are they talking about who's Melanie? Why are they talking about talking to Melanie? Lots of confusing things. And I am sure the prosecution will be able to smooth it out. And what it looks like to me, the prosecution is doing, and I'm sure they will accomplish this. You will have to go through incredible mental gymnastics to believe that Chad Daybell is so unlucky that they were able to bury children on his property. And even though he happened to be there the day that Alex was there, the day that, uh, Tylee went missing the day that he texted Tammy about shooting a raccoon when they had to, uh, you know, dig a hole in the, uh, in the property. Well, he didn't notice that they buried two kids there. Oh God. It makes me yeah. so mad. It makes me so mad. I so, found a East Idaho news article with the post quoted in there. I'll send you, you right want, now. Well, if you want to read it, that'd be great. Go ahead and read oh, okay. it. Duh. <laughs> you can okay. read. Yep. Where'd it go? Here it is. Okay. Now it says to introduce it says Daybell passed away, and investigators are calling her death suspicious. A week and a half earlier, on October 9th, she went on a neighborhood Facebook group and described what happened as she was getting out of the out of her car. Quote, something really weird just happened. And I want you to know so you can watch out. I had gotten home and parked in our front driveway. As I was getting stuff out of the back seat, a guy wearing a ski mask was suddenly standing by the back of my car with the paintball gun. He shot at me several times, although I don't think it was loaded. I yelled for Chad and he ran off around the back of my house. That's what she said. Yeah. yeah. It, I it, thought there it, was more, but that's what's on there. It definitely was him. Absolutely. Absolutely no question. Oh, but, yeah. You know, so. Just. Here's the doofus picture. Let me show it to you. I love this. Because he looks just like a doofus. He does. I, Look at that. Reminds me of something from a comic book. He does. I'm going to make it bigger here. Look at that. Just a stupid doofus. Yeah. Where did you get that? I screenshot it on my phone while I was watching it. Oh, that's great. That's yeah. perfect. Big I zoomed old, in to make it a little bigger. Big old stupid doofus, absolutely. So, um, there's one other thing I was going to tell you. Now I can't remember. I did here. Oh, here's something else I want to show you. Let's remember these two yep. on this day. OJ died. I could care less about him. He died owing like a hundred million dollars to the Goldman's. Yeah. And uh, there have been, I haven't seen any, you know, rest in peace, OJ, you poor thing. I haven't heard any of that. Just lots of, you know, I hope he's enjoying it in hell. So I hope it is easier now for them, for um, the Goldman's to get the money that they're owed from OJ, but that's Nicole his ex-wife and Ron Goldman, the victims. So that's who we need to remember today on this day that uh, OJ died. I'm not celebrating it. I'm not uh, not celebrating it. I'm not nothing. He was just a horrible piece of garbage that got away with murder. And uh, if anything, the Goldmans now don't have to sit there and see him on Twitter where he's going, hey, Twitter, right. you know, all happy, living his happy life while Ron Goldman is dead. So at least the family doesn't have to deal with that. Okay. Now, 
let's let's let me read this um, Gypsy Rose Blanchard article. And thank you to uh, I think it was Angela that sent it to me. Thank you, my dear, for doing that. Um, here we go. Okay, Gypsy Rose Blanchard. This is from the Independent. Gypsy Rose Blanchard files for restraining order against her estranged husband, Ryan Anderson. Oh, no. Now get this. She's filed a temporary restraining order against her ex-estranged husband, Ryan Anderson. According to court documents obtained by People, the papers were filed by Blanchard's attorney in the 17th Judicial District Court in the parish of La Forche, Louisiana. I know I totally butchered that name. Sorry. The filing has been sent to the assigned judge for review and to schedule any hearing dates if necessary, the clerk said. Um, Blanchard initially took to her private Facebook account to announce that she and her husband were separating. It comes three months after they were released, after she was released from prison. But it doesn't say why she filed a restraining order. This, you know, this isn't sounding good at all. Mm -mm. I'm this. I would be worried about her. Right. I mean, what she may do. Well, I'm just. That I may sound bad. This is all no, strange. That I was thinking the same thing. I oh. worry that she's setting him up. It's so weird. You know, look, I had to file a restraining order. He's being abusive. Is he? Can you trust him? Can you trust her? I don't, right. I don't know. I don't trust her because I think she's completely messed up. I think she's a mess. And again, you know, maybe she has legit reason for filing it. I don't know. It doesn't say. It just doesn't yeah. give us that information. But uh, I, I just, I don't know. Like I said, I worry when I was worried when the attention died down, what she might do. So let's see. Yeah, let's and just get any hearing dates if necessary. Took her private Facebook page, separation, more than eight years, blah, blah, blah. Nope, nothing. Doesn't say anything. Doesn't say anything about why she did it. So, I don't know. I don't know. It, uh, it concerns me. Yeah, this is because just... I, some strange stuff going on since she got out. So yeah, and I again, I'm not I'm not accusing her of anything, people. I just I worry about her mental stability, and it was a weird thing, what she did. And again, if you say well, it's none of your business. Well, she's making it my business because she's going publicly all the time with it, you know. And so did he. I mean, he jumped right in there too. So it is our business because they're making it all public. So there you go. Let's see. Oh, Mary Woodruff. This is interesting. Yeah, we saw that picture, remember? The That's side right. Side by side. Yeah. Gypsy married her mother. I know he looks just like her, doesn't he? Right. Facially, yep. Features. It's weird. You're absolutely right, Mary Woodruff. Woodruff, absolutely. Yeah. You guys, here's the thing. And I and I Jeannie Phipps, I agree. She's gonna do anything to stay in the spotlight. And I'm not saying She's not responsible, but let's face it. She had a horrible childhood. She was terribly abused by this crazy woman. So we can't expect normalcy out of this poor woman until she gets some real hardcore help. And that means staying out of the spotlight. And, you know, I'm talking intense, intense psychotherapy. So uh, Kat's Gallery, let's see. Kat's Gallery said, I heard it was because she locked herself in her bathroom and spent time communicating with her ex-fiance while her husband was upset that she locked herself away. Yeah, oh, maybe geez. he was pounding on the door. I mean, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? It's just, again, uh, I do feel for her, but my it stops if she starts hurting other people. So that's, that's where it stops with me. Okay, okay. Let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, this is a controversial one. I had, did not oh. keep up with this, and there was a reason why I didn't, because I was so upset when I heard about it. But uh, uh -huh. Nicola, is it Mew? Is that how it's pronounced? Yeah. He is guilty of reckless homicide in the Apple River stabbing. Now, this is where he was looking for a cell phone. He, uh, they were on a river. 
He came upon some teenagers, asked about the cell phone. There were words exchanged. I'm not even sure. He ended up saying he was in fear of his life. He stabbed and killed. Did he kill two or one? One. Stabbed one. like a few, yeah. but only one died. Okay. And he was guilty of reckless homicide. And oh. it. this is one of those cases where I started to read it and I'm like, I can't. I'm just, this is just too upsetting. This is just too upsetting. And I asked somebody in chat who followed it closely. Mm. And the person in chat said the both parties were at fault, you know. So I don't know if you all watched it or, or not, but he was found guilty of reckless homicide. I was reading today a lot of people's response that had watched the trial. Mm -hmm. And like nine, literally nine out of ten of them said that those teenagers had total culpability in it. And that they didn't agree with the verdict. Really? See, that doesn't yeah. surprise me. And that was one of the reasons why I couldn't watch it or follow it. Because I was, I, I just. Yeah. And there'd be like it. one sprinkled in there that said he got what he deserved type thing, you know. Right. Exactly. Um, half, um, excuse me. Half Fast Haku says, basically pronounced La Fouche Parish. Thank you, La Fouche. I will remember that. And exactly, Forsen's mom, I heard alcohol was the problem. They were all drunk. Yeah, it was it was bad. It was very bad. So did you watch the video of it? I couldn't. I started to. I couldn't oh. bring this. I just oh. couldn't. Did you? Yep. The whole thing. Yeah. I did. What did you think? Well, you know, we don't what we see is when he starts walking up to the inner tubes and there's a young man on one of the inner tubes who has his phone out mm -hmm. and he's filming and he yells, you know, well, who are you? And they all start yelling and everything. Now, I don't know what precipitated that, of course, but it looked like that's when he was just coming over to the inner tubes and he did move the one with a kid on it or whatever. But before he even got to them, he didn't even have a chance to say, hey, have you seen a phone or anything? They start yelling and screaming and all this crazy crap. Yeah, it was you know, Bipolar before. Express. It was Bipolar Express, I think. Yeah, Bipolar Express has a different opinion, says the kids were jerks, but he could have walked away. I totally agree with the verdict. And maybe that's it. Maybe they were being jerks and horrible and he could have turned and gone the other way. I don't know enough about it, but it just made me mad because it was so senseless. It yeah. could have been avoided somehow, some way could have been avoided. So. It's just, it's a big mess. Just a big mess. Right. That's what yeah. it was watching the video. It's just a nightmare looking at it. The whole thing was just mm -hmm. so unnecessary on everybody's yeah. part. And it, it just, it shouldn't have happened. Exactly. And uh, uh, Jeannie Phipps says, I do agree. He lied way too much. I've heard people say that too. So um, oh, I hate chocolate. I hate chocolate. So good to see you again. Yay. Two nights in a row. I'm so happy to have you back. Uh, it says the dude that yelled and filmed was responsible for it all. And I've heard that too. Yeah. So, and four sons mom says if they'd had to stand your ground law, he might have not, he might have been found not guilty. That could be. Absolutely. Let's see what Glamis Girl says here. Um, living in Arizona and a kayaker and tuber and teen sons the same age as the teens, I'm disgusted by their behavior. Doesn't happen on rivers here because we have water guns. Well, that's interesting. I don't know. Like you said, it's a big mess. And I might have feel totally different if I'd have watched it. Like I said, I really can't comment on it because I don't know enough about it. So, right. And Lindy Bridges says, um, when he testified, he kept changing his story. I wanted to believe him. So. Well, here's the deal: we have the vi the video, uh, the yeah. whole video of what happened. So yeah. whether he lied or not has nothing to do with what occurred that day. Now, if he he lied and tried to cover up what happened or whatever and try to get rid of the weapon, you know, then he could be charged with perjury or or things right. like that. But that's not a homicide. Right. You know. And Glamis Girl said he panicked, understandably. Lies weren't okay on both sides. Oh, boy. Oh, okay. See, I didn't know this part. He was searching underwater for the phone and the kids accused him of looking at the girls and yes. being a fur. Okay, yeah, that I didn't know. Two of them started screaming at him, you're looking for little girls. Yeah. Oh my God. Now, Gray posted that the video of the incident on the river. 
Mm-hmm. And he broke it down really good and he did slow frames and he stopped it where you can see when he reached for the knife, when mm-hmm. it was in his hand and when everything happened. Mm-hmm. So I watched the whole breakdown of it. So that's what, what I did, saw. What yeah. did Gray think? Did he have an opinion? Um, from what I recall, he thinks it was a more self-defense. Got it. I'll send you, I can send you the video. But, okay. That'd yeah. be great. I'd appreciate it. I hate chocolate says, I think he lied because he just couldn't accept what had happened and yeah. he was in shock. And that could be, you know, that's, I wonder when somebody experiences something like that, mm-hmm. what do you recall right away after, you know, what is your memory? Like everything probably happened so fast. You don't remember half of what was going on. Yeah. You have your adrenaline pumping and things. Um, that's, that's true. Know, I don't know. Uh, he, he did toss the weapon and then lied mm-hmm. that the kids had, uh, according yeah. to, he did toss the weapon. And then according to uh, Jeannie Phipps and the kids lied, he lied about the kids having knives. Yeah. So, yeah. oh boy. Anyway. Okay. So we'll, we'll see there. I'm sure there'll be an appeal on that. But again, that was very, very surprising. Okay. We have two more to, oh, we have three more to cover here. The Slender Man case, which is pretty interesting. Brian Kohlberger, which is, boy, that judge was mad. And uh, Mm -hmm. Kevin Frankie, which is just weird. So how about if we go with the Slender Man case here? Because that just happens to be next on my list. I can't believe it's been 10 years. I thought this was just like a few years ago. I know it feels like that. What I will say about that that young lady, Morgan, Mm -hmm. is her dad's schizophrenic. Oh, dear. And at one point, she had been diagnosed schizophrenic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that was changed later on or if it was a misdiagnosis or what came about later, but you know. Well, this is about a three minute video on the subject. So um Good. yeah, this is this is gonna explain it all. So thank you. Let me share this uh from the people at uh at Fox News in. Let me tell you where this is at. Hold on. Fox News in Milwaukee. So here we go. One of the women responsible for the 2014 Slender Man stabbing will be staying put for now. A judge denying Morgan Geyser's request for conditional release. Brett Lemoyne is live with what this means for Geyser's chances of release in the future. Well, defense attorney Anthony Cotton says Geyser will try again in six months. Keep in mind, Geyser was only 12 years old when she stabbed her friend 19 times. For two days. My opinion is that this is a appropriate time for her to be conditionally released. Morgan Geyser listened to experts talk about her mental health. I think she's continuing to wrestle with some of these complicated issues. The 21-year-old petitioned the court in January for conditional release. Three doctors evaluated Geyser and filed reports. Two of them said she's not ready. Her reliability of her self-reporting is hard to know. That makes her a significant risk. Geyser's attorneys want her moved to a group home. The director of the facility Geyser is in now agrees. And I do think at this point it is critical for her to make the transition to the community to help with her ongoing development. But there was also testimony about Geyser telling doctors she faked her mental illness. Geyser says she was sexually abused as a child. Doctors testified Geyser hasn't been violent toward anyone else since the stabbing. She's also been off her antipsychotic medication since December of 2022. Doctors say she's had no issues. Morgan has improved quite dramatically. Experts diagnosed Geyser with schizophrenia and post-traumatic stress disorder. The victim's family is uh, vehemently opposed to the release of Morgan Geyser. Ultimately, Judge Michael Boren agreed, saying Geyser's credibility is an issue. He believes the public would be in danger if Geyser left the 24-7 care she's currently receiving. Under these circumstances, this court satisfied that the, that the scales tip in favor of the public, and it tips that way by clear and convincing evidence. Now, one doctor testified today saying it would be good for Geyser's social development to transition to a group home. Geyser has spent half of her life in confinement. Doctors say she's only had about six supervised visits in the community in the last decade. 
Reporting live in Waukesha, Brett LeMoyne, Fox 6 News. Brett, one might think if you were trying to say, I am ready to be released, that you would be saying those words yourself. But we don't hear from her. Why not? Is she not given the opportunity? No, she had the opportunity today, Ted. And in fact, she came very close to speaking to the judge. Uh, but Anthony Cotton, her defense attorney, ultimately encouraged her not to, uh, saying that she really just wanted to apologize to the victim in this case. Brett Lemoyne reporting live for us. Okay, I got to tell you, this young lady scares me. Yeah. She absolutely scares me to death. Um, I would no way would want her released in the community yet. Because, again, not her fault if she was sexually abused. That would ex actually explain quite a bit. Um, not her fault for being schizophrenic, if she is schizophrenic. None of that is her fault. However, her behavior as a 12-year-old, it shows me that her critical thinking skills are not there. And just... I, I would have loved to have heard her speak to see right. if she had improved, but she scares me. I, again, just speaking of as Jane Q Pub, public here, yeah. she scares me. So yeah, burnt popcorn, the victim, victim survived by the way of the slender man stabbings yeah. again, real quick. Slender man is a, um, a fictional character. He's a big, tall, scary dude. And, they were all worshiping slender men, you know, being goofy kids and well, pretending yeah. to worship a slender man, but they took it way too far. This, this friend of theirs, they decided to sacrifice for slender man. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. They you know, heard how many times she was stabbed. She did survive. But again, you're right, burnt popcorn. I can't imagine that victim, that poor victim, you know? There's this website called Creepy Pasta. And they made up scary stories and mythological stories like that and said, you know, like they were real. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to, I've read them because my kids did some of them when they were younger, when it first came out mm -hmm. and everything like that. And so that's kind of where Slender Man comes from, is that. Gotcha. So, yeah. but it's, re it's very popular. Getting back to Gypsy Rose, I, Joyce, I, I agree. Can you imagine her meeting up with Gypsy? Oh my God, that would be terrifying. The two of them, I can't even, and see, that's just it. I'm not saying she's going to meet up with Gypsy, but if you release her, even on a conditional release, you don't know who she's going to meet up with and start, you know, these fantasies again. It's just, it's like I said, just scares me. So you're right. Anyway, um, Jeannie Phipps says, my kids were 14 and 11 then, and my kids were terrified of Slender Man. I was terrified of Slender Man. I read the story. I'm like, damn, this <laughs> is a scary story. No, wow, God, I couldn't believe it. So, okay, let's see. We have two more to go. Brian Kohlberger. Wow, wow. what a mess, you guys. Brian Kohlberger is charged with the stabbing deaths of the uh, Idaho Four, the students in Idaho. The defense hired a company to do a survey. And what ended up happening in this small town is they ended up uh, you know, tainting the jury pool, but I'm going to, I'm going to play a video here that, uh, that will explain it better. But boy, the judge was mad today. He, ooh, he was, a, he was hot, 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 hot. Now this is 13 minutes long. We're not going to play the whole thing. This is from the law and crime network, but, um, I think it's important to understand what's going on here. Cause we thought there was going to be a trial like at the end of the year, I don't know. They may have to move it. They've been wanting to move it forever uh, to get a change of venue. And maybe this was part of it, but uh, we're going to play this in conjunction with YouTube's fair use policy. Let me share this. And so we will be stopping this video occasionally to chit chat, if you will. Here we go. It's done. It's worth the hysteria and the hyperbole that keeps getting expressed in this courtroom. Brian Koberger's defense team pushing back against claims their survey of potential jurors violated a gag order and tainted the jury pool, while prosecutors cede no ground on the issue. If it can't be done right, 
or if that's what it takes to do it right, then we need to do it. This is a big case. If you were wondering how it could be possible to... And the finger for this cannot be pointed at anybody but the defense. Thanks for joining me for Crime Fix. I'm Anjanette Levy. Things are certainly heating up in Brian Koberger's case. Typically, things are pretty cordial between Prosecutor Bill Thompson and Koberger's defense attorney, Ann Taylor. She actually worked for him many years ago. But things have changed a little bit and become more tense since the prosecution found out that the defense commissioned a survey of potential jurors in Latah County, Idaho. Koberger has maintained his innocence in the murders of four University of Idaho students, Maddie Mogan, Kelly Gonsalves, Ethan Chapin, and Zana Kronodal. Prosecutor Bill Thompson talked about the survey questions that were asked to the 400 residents in Lehtaw County by phone. He claims those violated the court's non-dissemination order. They included things like, did you know Brian Koberger was arrested at his parents' house in Pennsylvania? Did you know DNA found on the knife sheath matched Brian Koberger? And the state's position is that the fact-specific questions, and I, I understand, Dr. Edelman, why the questions are asked. I understand his explanation. It doesn't change the fact that we have a non-dissemination order that specifically prohibits that kind of dissemination of facts, specific facts about this case. But there were questions that contained false information that really got the prosecutor mad, specifically when Bill Thompson cross-examined Dr. Brian Edelman, who's conducting the survey. Take a look. Uh, real quick, this is from our good friend, Anjanette Levy at Law and Crime. We're talking about the Kohlberger case and the defense hiring a company to do a survey that some are saying has tainted the jury pool. Here we go. You acknowledge false that uh, Mr. Kohlberger allegedly stalked one of the victims. That's false. You know that to be false. Which one? Did Mr. Kohlberger allegedly stalked one of the victims? Yes, I was trying not to say that. Because but but, you, but that. You, knew, you knew that was false. I did. So we learned something new there. A couple of media outlets had reported that Brian Koberger stalked one of the victims in the months before the murders. The prosecutor now says that's not true. But back to the issue at hand. The prosecution believes Dr. Edelman's methods tainted the jury pool and violated the gag order. Things got a little spicy. I'm sorry if you're feeling hurt about us raising this issue. I could see you were almost breaking down a few minutes ago when we were talking about slide number 33 uh, on oh, slide number 31. That's not the intent. And it's certainly, I was, I'm surprised to see that reaction from an experienced expert such as yourself. So I really? apologize for that. I, I accept your apology. But the idea of after you're working really hard 15 years to develop a credible reputation and being told on uh, watching on a Zoom that I am tainting the jury pool and poisoning the jury pool and contaminating the jury pool by doing what's required and standard, I'm not crying. I'm angry. Okay. And yes, it doesn't and, matter. And please go ahead and be as angry as you like as you continue your work for the defense in this case. So you probably detected a little sarcasm there from the prosecutor. The defense, meanwhile, fighting back against the claim that their expert violated that non-dissemination order. We didn't violate the non-dissemination order. You know, the, the information that now he's calling facts, you know, he's flip-flopping between whether or not it's a, a false fact or a fact that's, that's in the survey. The information that was put in the survey is based on the public record and information that the way that the state and state actors put information into the public record that has now been disseminated. And we have not violated that order. And I do resent being accused of that. But Judge John Judge said there were questions featured in the survey that included false information that may have been featured in media reports or on social media, but those were not discussed in an actual public document or record. And that concerned him. Again, this is uh, Law and Crime on the program called Crime Fix with Anjanette Levy talking about Brian Kohlberger's case. Let's continue. I mean, those, those two questions were not in the public record. They were. I mean, they came out, but that, that was not the, not the, uh, the court, the, 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 um, 
mean, where it came from. It just came out of the media or somewhere. Who knows where it came from? But I don't think there's anything, not that I'm aware of, in the in the public record that said anything about that, about your client. Dr. Edelman testified that he knew about the non-dissemination order. Of the existence of the non-dissemination order changed how you did your work? No, you did not. Have you worked in cases where there's a non-dissemination order at other times? Many times. And he said that just 3 to 4% of the people surveyed in Layton County didn't know about the case. The number of people in Layton County who did know about the case and had feelings about it was much, much higher. Because we asked these questions, what we found is that, um, one, like, like I said, very high recognition rate. So 79% of respondents knew at least five of these items. So the idea that we're set, like, undermining his due process rights, everybody knows all this stuff. It's very high rates. 82% um, of respondents who recognize seven of these items or more reported that he's guilty, compared to if they only knew two or fewer, only 29%. I was guilty. And the average was 6.2. So the average number of these details people already know, 6.2. And Dr. Edelman explained that the information he included in his questions came from media reports and the affidavit filed in support of the murder charges. Okay. Anyway, that's about half the report there. And uh, the prosecution was really mad and the judge gets uh, annoyed later as well. So very heated day in court. And I will put that link in to Anjanette Levy's uh, report in the description as well. But I would not be surprised to see change of venue. What do you think, Insightful One? Yeah, and I actually think they should change the venue. I do too. Uh, why Why risk it? Because right. first of all, there's a very good chance it's going to be found guilty. Because the DNA, the DNA actually, you know, they were able to trace back to his father and then able to, you know, trace it back to to him directly mm -hmm. but um why risk the 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 chance of an appeal like this you know this appeal can really it could really be messed up you know by this so why risk it but right. even here they change the venue for paul flores and the Kristen smart murder and then lacy peterson you know scott peterson the venue oh, was right. changed yeah, yeah. Because of all the, uh, speaking of Paul Flores, didn't you send me something? Didn't he get the crap beat out of him again in prison? Yep, the second time he was attacked in prison. Second, they're not, you know, here's the thing. I get it. I do. I understand it. We're supposed to be human and more civilized than that. Um, but I, it doesn't sound like the guards are doing their job there. That, uh, we'll have to wait and see. But yeah, is uh, what's his condition? I didn't read the article. I just saw the headline says he's back in the prison he's okay yeah oh melissa oh you just put that up yeah. melissa 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 yeah. this particular lab that did the dna testing is beyond reproach yeah so, so if, but it'll come out yeah it hasn't it has nothing has been officially said yeah but from uh reports that have suggested who the lab is again nothing we don't know for sure, right. but um, a lot of people have said the name of the lab. I'm not going to say it because I have no idea, but I'm telling you, if it is this lab, there is no doubt that the DNA is beyond reproach. Absolutely, yeah. Melissa, absolutely. Because from what I understand, and I'm not talking about just this lab, I'm talking about how they do these things in general. From what I understand, they take the DNA and they build a strand, but then they also use uh, genealogical research, okay? It's not just that DNA. I mean, they that's how they were able to trace it. Yeah, and to the find dad. Yeah. His father, they found his father, okay? Mm -hmm. And then what Brian Kohlberger was doing was he was bagging up his garbage and putting it in the neighbors. Now, why would you do that? Unless you knew they were looking for you, you know? I mean, come on. So, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, let's, let's, um, she wants to clear it up here. Let, let's clear it up. Let's clear it up. Hang on. Touch DNA is not reliable as how the DNA got there in the first place. I'm not doubting the DNA was his. Got it. Okay. 
Well, okay. Here's the thing on that, Melissa. I understand what you're saying. But uh, first of all, no, he wasn't even in the uh, the scope of the investigation. Nobody knew who he was. Right. So it's like, why would somebody grab his DNA, you know, a flake of his DNA and put it there? And supposedly in media reports, there is also a bloody thumbprint, you know, so there's other evidence. But um, well, also they were stabbed to death. There's a knife sheath found by the bed. Yes. With the DNA. I mean, so, you know, you kind of put exactly. two and two together, you know. Exactly. And and Melissa says many innocent people have been convicted on touch DNA. And I'm not I, I am not arguing that touch DNA can't uh, be, you know, uh, sometimes problematic. OK, but it depends on the whole case in general. Yeah. And yeah. that's why detectives go through to rule out, OK, could they have been in the house, you know, at this particular time before the murders? Could it was have he there been there some party? another? Yes. Yeah. Was he there exactly. at a party and did it yeah. float on? Yeah, exactly. 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 No. But Melissa, I, I see what you're saying. I understand. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it uh, will. We'll just have to wait and see. But they are, I'm sure the defense is going to attack the DNA, but they're going to have a hard time when they'll be able to prove that the DNA led to the father mm -hmm. and led to their son who was putting their gar his garbage, separating it and putting it in another garbage can. Yeah. Why would you do that? You know, just that behavior right there. It's like, really, really? And they're, they have more, they have more. They haven't told yeah, us. Yeah, if there's no reasonable explanation for his DNA being in that house, um, Oh my God, I just lost it. Being in the house. And there was one more thing, but now I forgot. That's okay. It's because, it was because you're getting old, because you're 80. I don't want to tell people that, but it's true. Well, 80 isn't old. You're 90. You're 90. Uh, so you are 90. No, I, I know what you mean. If there's no reasonable explanation for that DNA to be in his house, the only explanation could be that he oh. is the murderer. Yeah, and if he lied about ever being in the house, that's one thing they do. They'll ask, have you ever been in that house and stuff? Mm -hmm. So if in the first interviews and stuff, if there were any, right? because um, he lawyered up, you know, if he lied and said, no, I was never there, well, that's an issue too. Right. And I'd like to welcome everybody in chat. Thank you so much for joining us this Thursday night. And I know the replay crew is going to be here a little bit later. So shout out to you all. Okay, we have one more uh, case that we're going to talk about here. And I was really shocked to hear this. This is from our good friend, Kathy Russin. We love her at Court TV. She is incredible. Let me grab it out here. There it is. This is from her X account. It's Twitter, Elon. It's Twitter. I refuse to call it X. Are you ready for this, people? This is in the 4th Judicial District Court in Utah County, State of Utah. Kevin Frankie is the plaintiff versus Jody Hildebrandt. Okay, here's the scoop. Uh, anyway, he's suing Jody Hildebrandt. And this is the legalese of it all. Wherefore, plaintiff prays for judgment against defendant as follows. A, for past, present, and future special damages. B, for past, present, and future pain and suffering. C, for all past, present, and future losses and harms and all other general damages as are justified under this cause of action. D, for exemplary, exemplary punitive damages as might be determined at trial. E, for pre-judgment and post-judgment interest, cost, attorney's fees, and any or all such further relief as to the court seems just and equitable. In other words, he's uh, suing her. He took this big thing of spaghetti and he threw it at the wall and he's going to see what sticks. He's suing her for all the damages. I get it. She deserves to be sued. She deserves to lose everything. But well, those kids might be need. Those kids are going to need therapy for years and years. And he's yeah. the, the parent that's left to pay for that. So. It, exactly. And she has like a $5 million house. I say absolutely. Absolutely. But I, as I told you at the beginning of my, of the, uh, this live stream, mm -hmm. I have a real problem with him uh, because before Jody came along, I, I, Ruby was abusing those kids in my opinion, and he was there then, but no question, the horrendous abuse that those kids suffered under, 
uh, Jody Hildebrandt and Kevin was out of the house and not allowed to have contact. And that was Jody Hildebrandt's fault as well. Well, Jody and Ruby's, but that's what Jody did. Again, she would go into homes and uh, get, say it's the husband's fault, kick him out, move in, take over and cause all these horrible problems and ruin families and destroy children. Yeah. And she is an evil beast. She is, I, she needs all 60 years as does Ruby, both of them. And now Ruby's like, Oh, the, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the fog is lifting. I see my mistake in my ways. No, you don't stop it. Both of you deserve 60 years, if not more for what you did to those kids. I yeah. mean, her son, made a TikTok where he was dancing and happy that his mother is in prison. What does that tell you? <laughs> uh, I got started. I need my blood pressure pills. That's all there is to it. Okay. So I think I've pretty much uh, offended everybody tonight and I do apologize. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you know, I love you. And let me just say, I was talking about my 80 years old. I was talking about my grandpa in the sixties, not about, I have, Several of my friends are in their 80s and they are like, they're so much younger than I am in every way, shape or form. So I do apologize. That is not, that is not what I meant. Oh, please understand. Please, please, please. I think everybody knows you well enough by now. I hope so. I hope so. Um, hold on. Kevin was allowed to have contact. He just didn't do it. Well, that, excuse me. You're right. That's what I meant. He was told not to have contact by Ruby and, and Jody. It, you're right. He could have forced it, but he listened to Ruby and Jody. And, you know, Ruby, excuse me, Jody was a church sanctioned therapist. At this time, I don't know if she was by then. She may have been kicked off as one of the um, uh, LDS church approved therapists. I'm not sure of that timeline, but yes, you're absolutely right. So, apps all good, Lindy. Thank you, Lindy. Thank you, thank you. You are sweet. Okay, I think that's it. Um, quick question: Did yep. Dennis Woodruff, Webster's High School bud, say if he was single? Uh, just asking for a curious friend, of course. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody said. Well, um, you know what? There was some a woman in here that had the same last name. She came in after he was he chatted. Oh, so, so I bet it's his wife. Yeah. See. I'm telling you guys, maybe in my Sheba's next girl. Class, <laughs> no. I, know, I love Sheba's girl asking for our friend. <laughs> Hi, Beth B. Good to see you, my darling. Um, I, uh, there you go. Candy Williams, Ruby wore the pants. Kevin paid the bills. That's exactly right. Sheba's girl. I love you. Here's the thing. I, um, I think I'm going to try not to get emotional here in my next life. I will find love. It just wasn't meant to be in this life. I have, you know, the love of my child, the love of my friends, uh, my good, good friends. What? Her comment. Could have been it's his mother. Oh, <laughs> she was girl. Oh, my God. I love you. <laughs> I his love sister, you. she says. Or his sister. Could have been. Let's hope. Let's hope. No, I, you guys really, the next, the next life, maybe I, I was such a romantic when I was younger. I wanted somebody to love me and just have romance and love. And it, my brain has shifted and I don't, I used to hurt about it a lot, really hurt. I don't anymore because I'm happy with what I have and I'm so grateful for what I have. But like I said, in my next life, I maybe will find somebody. I mean, hey, if somebody walks in and it happens, great. But like I said, the only way I'm ever going to meet a guy is if I'm driving to my girlfriend's and I hit him with my car. You know, I have to pay for his hospital oh, bill. Geez. That's about it. I'm not going to meet anybody. There's no way. I don't, you know, I don't do anything. So <laughs> Candy Williams, I understand. <laughs> Sheba's girl could have been his mother. I love that. <laughs> it's so funny. Cracks me up. You guys, you guys absolutely crack me up. I love you. <laughs> um, let's see. I just want to read what Cheetah No More says. Talking to Cat's Gallery, in my opinion, they don't even care about the victims at all. They don't want eyes on them. But oh my God, after Lori Vallow and Hildebrandt, pathetic. I know it is terrible. Uh, Angela Conley says, are you not going somewhere soon? Well, actually I am going to a, oh God, I better check on that. I bought one ticket to go see this comedian. He's hilarious and I can't remember his name, but he's coming to Dallas. 
I'm glad you said something. And then, you know, I will be traveling uh, to Utah back home for a little bit in the summer. So we'll have to we'll have to wait and see. But anyway, maybe I'll meet somebody at the comedy store, who knows, or the comedy wherever I'm going at some club in Dallas with this comedian. But I promised my girlfriend that I would go out, try and get out once a week. It's turning out to be once a month, but to go out once a month to do something, you know, last month it was the murder mystery thing, which was really fun. So anyway, okay, I am heading out, everybody. I want to thank Moonlight View and Four Sons Mom. Thank you so much. Of course, Ping the Router, I think, is coming back on tonight. I really hope to see Love and Coco soon. But I'll tell you what, it is great to see I Hate Chocolate in chat again. And Insightful One, thank you for all that you do. Is today Thursday? Yep. Okay, so we still have one more day of true crime and then it's woo-woo. So tomorrow, no court with Chad Daybell. But we'll be here by gosh, by golly. And don't forget to check out websleuths.com. And don't forget to check out DNA Solves. We ask that you donate to DNA Solves to help uh, help them raise some money to get the DNA testing done for the uh, bodies and the remains of people that have found that are not identified. I'm going to put that link in the description as well. Okay? Okay, everybody. Insightful one, thank you so much. We will see you tomorrow night, 1030 Eastern on Websleuths. YouTube live. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.